All right. So uh, I guess it's about that time. So uh, I'd like to thank you guys for coming to hear me uh, talk about the Internet of Things and our, our take on it. So my name is Brian Hughes, and I'm a CTO and founder of GoFactory. Um, we're an early stage Internet of Things company. Uh, we've got a Internet of Things platform, but more importantly, we're building enterprise and industrial applications on our platform. And so today what I'm going to do is kind of talk a little bit about um, the relationship of things, which is kind of a different take on it. Um, and then I'm going to also talk a little bit about the challenges and considerations in building a scalable Internet of Things platform. Um, and then finally, what I'd like to do is, is hopefully we'll have some time and I'll demo one of our uh, uh, solutions that we're bringing to market, which is for advanced uh, auto dispatch and uh, asset management for traffic uh, light control. So, um, so without too much ado, so I'm, I made this talk kind of somewhere in uh, for kind of a moderate. Uh, it's not a advanced so much. Um, so the Internet of Things, you know, we've heard about this, and you probably you know we're on day two now, 50 billion things. You know, this is becoming a little bit wearied here. You know, there's a little bit of Internet of Things fatigue kind of going on. Um, the reality, though, is, is that while this is kind of a hot topic and it's being talked about a lot, uh, a little bit too much, it's, it's, it's reality, right? So we're, we're fastly approaching a world where everything is instrumented. Everything is measuring something, and everything needs to talk to each other, right? There's sensors. So we have this rapid rise of 50 billion things by in just six years from now, according to Cisco. And, you know, if you look at the history of the Internet, it's kind of amazing to see that, Dar you know, DARPA started around in the 60s and just kind of like the explosive growth of when things on the Internet surpassed human beings. And what's interesting about that is that that actually happened this year. So this year was the first time in history that the number of non-humans on the Internet pa surpassed humans. Now, what's really interesting about that piece of factoid is that it's actually not so much a harbinger of the Internet of Things. It's just that there are more search bots reading things on the Internet than there are people reading things on the Internet right now. So the indexers. So what is the Internet of Things? Well, so the Internet of Things is really uh, this convergence that's happening. It's a very unique time in our history where you have three uh, influencing factors coming together. One is Moore's laws, Metcalfe's laws, and big data. What does this mean? So I have smaller, cheaper, uh, lower power processors, right? So I can get Bluetooth beacons for seven dollars now. You can almost go to a vending machine and pop these sensors out. You have all sorts of interesting uh, uh, hardware and devices that are coming in over from manufacturing from China that are super, super cheap. Then you have Metcalfe's law, which is telecom. Suddenly, Broadband is everywhere. It's pervasive, right? And the interesting thing is, is there's this illusion of always connected, and the reality is always trying to connect. But it's still there, right? And thirdly, what you have is you have big data. You have the ability for software systems to do something with this massive quantity of information that's coming from every single sensor that's now connecting to the Internet. So we're really living in an awesome time where we're instrumenting the world. Every aspect of our world over the next uh, decade or two is going to be instrumented, and it's going to be talking to the cloud. Right? So <coughs> what is the relationship of things? So if I start looking at, okay, I've got 50 billion things, you know, some of them are humans, some of them are, or the majority of them are non-humans, well, if they're all talking to each other, well, what's that? What, what is that? That's just a bunch of noise. Well, if I have 50 billion things all trying to talk to each other, it's, it's just kind of like a cacophony of, of deafening sound. So in order to really start to consider the Internet of Things and start to consider how do I actually make something that works, that I can use, I really have to start looking at it as, well, what, how are those things existing out in the real world? Right? And so the Internet of Things is really about the naturally occurring relationship between things. Um, and these are things that need to do things with other things to get something done, and all this stuff is in real time. 
right? So it's great if I take and I measure a bunch of stuff from a sensor input, and then I try to run some big data over it and I get some insight, but what does that mean? That doesn't really mean a whole lot. I have to be able to take that information and do something with it, right? So, so these relationships that I'm talking about tend to be small, right? So when you look at the massiveness and the enormity of the Internet of Things, and you change your perspective, instead of looking at this huge number of, of, of instrumented sensors, peoples, and devices, and I'm really going to look at it as, well, what is the natural organization? So I might have tens of things that need to do something together, hundreds or thousands, right? So now what I've done is I've taken this massive problem and I've scoped it down to something that I can do something about. So this is why the re thinking about this problem as a relationship between things is really the proper way to kind of move forward. So I have people that naturally group together. And what's interesting now is that even today, a person can be a group of things. I could have uh, my wearable Fitbits, I could have my Google Glasses, I could have all sorts of sensors that are attached to me that now need to work together in the formation of this group. And then I might want to take that group and group with other things. So, and then <laughs> I have groups and groups and communities. So as you start to look at this problem, it's kind of a, you know, it's an onion that just kind of layers outwards and outwards and it becomes kind of a network routing problem. But still, it's very manageable and very scalable. Another way to think, look at this too is I have a house. And inside my house I might have five rooms. And inside each room I might have a half a dozen sensors. And I have maybe four or five family members that are constantly moving around the house, and then I have guests that are coming in and out of the house. So there's this notion of just because there are things that are statically placed in the world, everything else is in motion. So time and space is a really significant aspect of the Internet of Things. How do I interoperate with things that exist in the physical world that are doing things, right? And the key thing about these relationships is that they're really mostly ephemeral, right? So um, they're ephemeral and they're ad hoc. Um, <laughs> and that's a key thing to realize because as you start to build a solution or a platform or try to address, build systems, you can't take traditional approaches, right? I can't, I can't go and I can't, so sure I can create an address book you know, of, of 50 billion unique endpoints. That's not, that's definitely a problem that Google can solve. But I can't create an address book of every possible combination and relationship between those things as they're out in the real world. For example, I have a car with a DSRC radio. I have people with their, their ha uh, smartphones. I have uh, uh, Zigbee or six low pan sensors that are telling me where par free parking is available. I have a, uh, uh, a wireless uh, parking meter, and I have a transaction processor. So how do I, in a frictionless manner, allow these relationships to form between the car, the parking space, the parking meter, the person, and the uh, transaction processing system? And that relationship's going to last for about two hours, right? That's the two hours that I'm going to be parked there. So. Uh, Everything, like I said, the world is, we're really kind of moving quickly. And uh, there are sensors everywhere. There are devices everywhere. You're hearing a lot of these connected city projects that are going on. Um, ironically, they're more they have better traction in the UK. So the UK, uh, there's, uh, Glasgow has one. Uh, so there are several projects right now that are underway where you take the street lights, you replace the lighting assembly, you put LED lighting there to reduce the cost, and inside the lighting assembly you put some sort of uh, mesh networking for an infrastructure communication network. So this is really ideally suited because you have street lights that are about you know every hundred or every three hundred feet apart. So you have a natural infrastructure from the street lights to create an electronic infrastructure. So in the connected city, as that kind of moves forward, this creates the opportunity for all of the uh, trash bins, all of the parking spots, all the electronic vehicle charging stations, all of the people, 
everything who are living within the city now as a means to communicate with each other. So in Europe, one of the bigger uh, pushes is uh, elect uh, network attached trash bins. And so these trash bins have sensors in them and they know when they're full, right? And so they actually can call through this infrastructure that's being uh, put in place, this networking, and they can actually schedule their own pickup, right? So <laughs> as we start to move into the Internet of Things and we start to look at the world as being an instrumented collection of everything, some of the possibilities just become mind-boggling. But what's interesting is how do I bring intelligence down to the trash bin so that it knows it's time to be picked up, right? So these are some of the interesting questions. So as, as I was saying, you know, 50 billion uniquely addressable endpoints, not really that big of a problem for a company like Google. How everything is going to happen to coexist with each other as they're discovering each other in the real world? Uh, that definitely is kind of a problem. So I can't really build you know, a database that says, here's every single parking sensor in the world. Here's every th single uh, home sensor in the world. Here's every single electronic vehicle charging station in every city in the world. I just can't do this. The reality is, is that things need to become discoverable. So you, it's, this gets back to my concept about the relationship of things. So if I have a car and it's looking for a parking spot, I, it needs to discover the parking spot through, by being in proximity of the parking sensor, right? So location, proximity, and discovery is really what is a fundamental cornerstone to the Internet of Things. Um, and it's important to understand too is, is that sensors, you have different types of sensors that exist in the, the real world. You have fixed sensors like parking uh, meters and parking, uh, parking sensors. And you have those that are kind of moving around, right? Like people with phones, cars with DSRC radio. It's, it's, so it's all things that are going to be discovering each other, passing by, whether they're statically positioned. And also it depends on their network connection, connectivity. So one of the bigger thing about the Internet of Things, which is very, uh, I find it very interesting, um, if you read a lot, as you read a lot of the papers and hear some of these discussions, one thing seems to be missing uh, in a lot, of the t uh, a lot of the talk, and that's the humans. So a lot of the uh, IoT platforms, a lot of the IoT companies out there, they're positioned as M to M, machine to machine. Right. But the challenge is, is that in order to create a, a real, effective interconnection of everything, like a connected city, connected home, you have people. Right? So I have to be able to let the person also discover the parking space. Right? I have to let the person be able to discover the connected, you know, the electronic vehicle charging station. Right? So people are very important. Um, they're the operators of the machines, they're users and consumers of the machines, of the sensors, of the networks. Um, they're also field service engineers who are taking care of the machines, who are helping repair them. And most important is humans with smartphones are really the ultimate sensor, right? Your, your, your phone, you know, it's got some awesome hardware inside of it that, that people, I think, the average consumers you know, don't necessarily always appreciate. So, what are some considerations when building uh, an IoT platform? So, some of the challenges are obviously uh, protocols, right? There's, you know, some current standards right now. But if anybody has been in the computer <laughs> industry for more than four or five years or ten years, you'll know that standards are ever-changing, right? There are new standards, new pro protocols that are coming into play. As new technologies are being developed, um, things get better. Sometimes they get worse. So the system fundamentally needs to be able to have some sort of protocol adapter to be able to seamlessly support you know, what type of messaging. So then I can integrate into legacy systems, I can integrate into uh, existing newly developed systems. 
So MQTT, AMQP, XMPP, these are some important protocols, depending upon the, you know, the type of endpoints that are going to be talking to each other. And then what's also more important is the support for IP devices, um, as well as sensors. So some sensors, and um, I actually brought a few. So some of the sensors uh, are simply BLE sensors, Bluetooth, low energy. So here, this little guy is a sensor that goes into a Fitbit. So this guy, you can actually, um, it's really awesome. So you, literally like almost vending machine ready. You can go down, there's a company called Sensiplex, one of our partners down in Menlo Park. And you can go up to them and say, I need an accelerometer, gyros a gyroscope, magnetometer, linear acceleration, and maybe some pedometer function. And they say, okay, great. And in two months, they come back with the mechanicals, the schematics, everything you need. And then for $10,000, you can have 20 of these things produced. You can test them out, prototype, say, good, awesome. Now for another $20,000, I can tool it. So with the $40,000 investment, I'm ready to actually manufacture my Fitbit. So these things can cost on a per, per run base of about $99. If you start getting them down into runs of like 100,000, you can get them down to $59, $69. So like a lot of the wearable health wearables, they're selling for about 120. So that's what I'm trying to talk about, like the awesomeness of, of where we are today. Like you can literally just go down there and you, you don't have to be a mechanical engineer, right? You just have this idea and they go in, they punch it in, they out pops this guy, right? So how do I then take this Bluetooth device and I cloud connect it? Well, it needs a proxy, right? So often it's your phone that's gonna be a proxy. It could also be a, a, a hub, like a, a sta if it's going to be an, an in-home system, it could be a hub. So, you, so gateways are, an, a very, are a very important part of the landscape in the Internet of Things. <laughs> so ultimately, because everything has to talk to each other and it's going to do it through some sort of uh, network messaging, it boils down to IP-based, right? So that means that it needs to go to the cloud and then distribute and find the endpoints, right? So your, when you're, if you're building your IoT platform, you need to then consider like, uh, it needs to be TCP or UDP. So one of the big challenges with building these things with all of the endpoints in place is security, right? So you hear people talking about security, security, security. And you can imagine what it'd be like if I have a, a city that has, you know, uh, 12,000 street lights or traffic lights, you know, and maybe 25,000 parking meters, and somebody is able to muster them into a botnet, right? That, that'd be an awesome attack, you know? Or if maybe somebody wants to do the denial of service attack on their nearby uh, traffic light, right? So, so security is very, very important, but there's some question uh, about how you approach security on the Internet of Things. The reality is that you really can't secure it. it. It really has to be a trust nothing model. So if you're going in and you're thinking that I can secure everything, you're wrong because not everything is securable. In order to secure something, you need to have SSL, right? I need to be able to put a cert on an endpoint or have some sort of token that I can guarantee with an encrypted communication with my endpoint. Problem is not everything's made that way. So this is a uh, GPS unit for fleet telematics. This is mass produced. It's on every light and heavy duty truck that's being used for delivery of like UPS, for uh, um, uh, DHL, for construction. So these guys, they talk, they use a cellular connection. They provide real time GPS information as well as engine data. And they're UDP, right? The most insecure way <laughs> communicate on the internet <laughs> as you can possibly imagine right and what's even worse is that their packets aren't encrypted <laughs> so that's changing though the manufacturers are actually at least moving to have packet level encryption but the problem is is that you can't start off with the internet of things and demand that everything be uh, to have SSL 
I can't demand that this massive company called Calamp put my library on their device, right? Why would they do? You know, it's like, even if, you know, I was a big company, we're, we're an early stage company, even if I was big, why would they do it? I mean, even if Cisco demanded to Calamp, you shall put this, you know, library on your device, you know, they'll probably say, sorry, I can't afford to do this, right? So, so securing the endpoints, it's really more of a matter of an, a trust nothing model, right? And then a trust nothing and then gained, uh, or gained privileges through layers of authentication. So, um, so some of the other uh, in, uh, types of devices. So six low pan, or so Bluetooth, LE, and beacons are very, very key. So here's a beacon to supporting the Internet of Things, right? Um, you need these because this, these are the only things that are in consumer devices. So if people are going to be part of the Internet of Things, it completely sets the conversation. It means 802.11 and Bluetooth. That's it, right? You're not going to have a person being able to find a Zigbee parking, center, uh, parking sensor. It's just not going to work because phones don't talk Zigbee. Zigbee is uh, 802.15.4, right? So <laughs> even 6LOPAN, which does route over the internet with IPv6, it's not on, no human being will ever be able to consume that message, right? So this means if humans are gonna be involved in some of these things that don't talk uh, 802.11 or Bluetooth, it has to route through some monolithic structure and then eventually find its way to the phone. Right, so that starts to question real time. Am I able to really build a real time system? Right, I'd rather have the human talking directly to the sensor. So, um, so these are see, these are definitely some of your different uh, technologies. Uh, and then again, as I've kind of started driving home the point right now, is that uh, humans, 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 and in order to include humans in the Internet of Things, you have to do Bluetooth LE or 802.11. And then finally, to build a platform that can scale to handle, like so for example, uh, we're working with a very large company in traffic management uh, uh, space industry. So New York City has 12,000 intersections. At every intersection, there are three control units. There's an intersection controller, conflict monitor, and uh, vehicle sensors, right? These three things need to work together in order to keep traffic flowing, which is essential to, if you've ever tried driving down Manhattan, right? <laughs> you know, the moment the, there's a blinking light, your life is screwed, right? So whether it's, whether it's tra traffic lights um, that need to coordinate with their components, uh, with field engineers to figure out how to get them, or whether it's uh, uh, like a, um, field a fleet with asset management where I have construction workers trying to get to a construction site, right? These really all come down to be the same problem. How do I know where everything is, that things are doing the right thing with the right tools and assets, right? This is the Internet of Things problem. So it has to be distributed. So how do I support handling tens, hundreds, and even billions of endpoints, right? So it's a distributed problem. So if you're in computer science or if you're, you're, you're you have to start to become very familiar with stuff like CAP theorem, right? You have to understand uh, how to build distributed systems. So for, us, so for us, we use Erlang, and we also use, oops, awesome screensavers. So Erlang is a great technology, again, considerations for if you're gonna build an IoT platform. Um, developed uh, over 25 years ago by uh, Ericsson, and it was uniquely designed for their telco switches. It's a, it's a um, uh, actor model with supervisor workers, fault tolerant, ideally suited for building a messaging solution for the Internet of Things. So, and then finally, in consideration of building an IoT platform, is uh, protocol buffers. So, protocol buffers are this awesome uh, encoding, decoding message structure by Google. So. So, what are some of the challenges of building an IoT platform? 
right? So I've given you some key ingredients so you can run home and kind of sprinkle them together, put them in a pot, and out pops your IoT platform. So the other challenges are, so what, what about the identity of things, right? So this is actually a significant challenge if anybody's attempting to do anything in the IoT space. So once upon a time, Phones, remember everything has to take in consideration human beings. So humans use either an iPhone or Android. And I think there's a few maybe Windows phones out there and maybe one Black, Blackberry somewhere. Um, <laughs> so the problem is, is that I have all these sensors out there. Some of them are secure, some of them aren't. They all have unique, identify, you know, unique addresses. That's the key thing about the Internet of Things is that every endpoint is uniquely addressable. I can, I can know that this sensor here, this little Bluetooth beacon, I, I know its address. I know its unique identifier, right? So the problem is, is that there are 1.5 billion f phones out on the market right now and growing. You know, I think the latest number of the iPhone 6 was 40 million they sold already. So Apple has spearheaded the way iOS 8 phones no longer broadcast Mac addresses. So what Apple has introduced in iOS 8 is randomized MAC addresses. So Apple single-handedly in one release of their software put, a, put about $250 million business out of business, <laughs> which are these companies that track your location indoors for doing aggregate information so that like mall, if they're set up in the malls, so that they can actually know where you're at and then try to entice you to come and shop, right? So, so Phones no longer are uniquely identifiable. Um, in the traffic management space I was talking about, there's actually a thing called the blue toad that they set up at the intersections. And what they do is that they actually watch the MAC addresses of vehicles driving by, because most people have their phones with them in their car. And that's one way they do actually traffic. They can measure traffic volume. And the speed of traffic is by looking at the MAC address of your phone as you're driving by intersection to intersection to intersection. Well, you can't do that anymore. So identity for humans is going to become a big problem very fast, right? So how do you solve that problem? How do I ensure that John is still John, right? So <coughs> um, the next thing is discovery. Right? So I have a gazillion of these beacons. I have a gazillion of these devices out in the world. Right? And they're all doing things and having fun. How do I discover them? Right? I can't actually know. I can't have a giant database that says, oh, look, I'm at the corner of 3rd and Howard. What's around me? Right? The better way is discovery through proximity, especially if it's a beacon. Right? So I can actually have things that are more interested in saying, I'm here, what else is around me? Right? And so that's important because there's a lot of intention base. Like I'm, I'm looking for a parking spot. Right? So I have an intention. I would like to find things that are nearby me that are parking spots. Right? So, and then security, as I talked about. Right? So how do you secure your IoT platform? Right? You're certainly not going to secure the endpoints. You don't own the endpoints. You don't control the endpoints. You have no idea what, what the endpoints are. But you need to support them. Right? Um, and then advertising too. So like, even if I take in an advertising peer-to-peer -peer model, right, how do I keep a catalog of 50 billion things that are all wanting and needing something and can exchange something? So. Um, and then one of the most important things is connection, connecting. So all things are not created equal. And up here I've shown you already, here's a wearable, here's a beacon, here's a UDP network attached sensor, and here's a smartphone, right? I can put, a, a li I can put my SDK a library on this guy, no problem. I can't put anything on here. And these guys, well, they're just sensors. Right? So the, 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 key, the key is that I have to be able to transform all of these disparate things and turn them into a first class citizen. So for this guy, how I do that is I, manu I turn, he plugs into my, my uh, cloud and it's just spitting a protocol saying here I am, here's my engine data. 
but you need to t turn it into a virtual agent. Right? So once you have an agent in the cloud, it becomes a first class citizen, and now it can do things. It can actually interact with a human. So now I can have my traffic light uh, or my intersection controller. It's represented by an agent in the cloud, and now it can start to do self-diagnostics. Right? It can start to say, oh, here's my problem. What do I do? There's some logic that's running in the cloud that's reading the information coming from, and it's now able to take action. One of those actions could be to dispatch the nearest field service engineer who happens to have the right part. Right? So, so that's, that's kind of where the awesomeness of the Internet of Things starts to come into play. And then this actually just kind of folds into collaboration and communication. So once I've taken these endpoints, I've made them smart, now they're able to collaborate and communicate. Right? I can actually have a, an intersection controller send a push notification to a human field service engineer. And actually, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in just a little bit. So that's probably the first time a traffic light has ever sent a push notification to a person. So, 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 so our real world example, and I haven't actually been paying attention to time. So um, I think I've got some good time still. Uh, Gina, sure. Sometimes I just start to ramble. So. Um, Oh, okay, so got a little bit of time. So um, what I'm going to show here now is, so this is, this is a functioning solution that we have that actually is going to, it's called Auto Dispatch and Asset Management for Traffic Management. So I'll kind of give you the run through real quick through the animated deck. So what we do is we're able to create a smart agent that represents each traffic, uh, each intersection controller. So, so these are all network attached and they're now with our platform turned into a first class citizen and they're able to do something, right? So as a first class citizen in the cloud, they can self-diagnose and say, oh look, here's what's going wrong. And so they have a set of, uh, they have a rule engine that's running inside of their, their nice little agent body and it's able to then take action upon conditions that it's experiencing. So this has become situational awareness into what's called situational optimization. So situational awareness is where I simply have a sensor network. A situational intelligence is where I take that sen sensor network and I bring it into some monolithic system and I do big data on it and I come up with some uh, KPIs or some alerts. Situational optimization is when I'm able to actually have the system self-correct, right? Take action. So here uh, we have the system that where the traffic intersection controller will call for help. A could route through uh, operations. And then basically what we use is we use, again, the full promise of the Internet of Things. We're using NFC tags, barcodes, and beacons to tag the necessary medium, low, uh, medium and high value assets. So we know where everything is at every, any given point and who's, cust uh, who's in custody it is. So let me... Um, try now. And give you guys a demonstration. There we go. So here, over here, we have a traffic intersection controller which is over here on 3rd and 16th. All right, so now I can tap on it. You can see, okay, it's doing, it's doing fine. So let me... So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to trigger a fault on it in just a second. But first I want to show you, so here is a Bluetooth uh, beacon. So I'm a field engineer. I'm running around doing my field engineering stuff, right? And I have a bunch of assets that are on my truck that I have, right? So I have a Honda Generator 2000 is one of my assets, right? So I'm going along. And let me go ahead and just turn this guy off. So this beacon here is on my generator. 
Well, now let's say, for example, somebody decides to try to steal my generator. Right? So I'm going to take the battery off the beacon. So um, we'll see how fast this goes. So what happens now is I've broken the leash. No, it's, it should, it'll, we'll see if it works. Um, so I've, I'm waiting for a push notification. So what happens is uh, the leash has been broken. And so it's like, okay, the asset is now out of range. And I'm waiting for a push notification, which sometimes can take a little bit longer because the, there it goes. So awesome. It's like, oh, crap. <laughs> my, my generator's gone. What the hell? So I go back into, and oh, Jesus, like it's red. It is gone. So I go looking for my generator, and you know, it's like, awesome. I found my generator, right? So now I've reestablished. So me taking out the battery was just so I didn't have to run out in the hallway and come back. <laughs> so, uh, so now I, I have the asset, and I'm using the Internet of Things, I'm using sensors in order to show how I can do all of this, you know, this asset tracking. So if you notice, I have in my inventory the CMU01, right? So I'm going to go ahead and kind of turn this off. And so what I'm going to do here is this is my intersection controller so that we're talking to. It's got all the fault information. So I'm actually going to trigger a fault. All right, so let's go ahead trigger a fault and then what it's done is it says it's found somebody who has my part and then now we get to wait for the push notification because we know how fast push notifications sometimes are so any moment um, so what happens now is what, what should happen is, is that the traff I'll get a push notification from the, the intersection controller so we'll maybe give it another second or two. <laughs> it's the challenge of having a, a, a non-instantaneous uh, messaging like push notifications. So what would happen then is, is that when I get the notification, um, it then says, hi, I'm, at the, I'm an intersection controller at 3rd and 16th, and I'm having a problem. Right? And so it'll say, are you available to come fix me? Right? And the, Say yes, and now suddenly you are assigned to the task and you're able to go fix that traffic light. So, so unfortunately, it doesn't seem like the push notification came through. So, anyways, um, but now I can come here and I can tap on my, my intersection controller, and sure enough, I can see all the faults, and I can come down here. And I can say, oh, look at that. It certainly is a mess, right? And so now I can go fix it. So this is kind of like what, we're t you know, the, the promise of the Internet of Things being kind of delivered into the real world, which is, you know, today you've heard probably a lot of discussion around the possible, you know, like the possibilities and, and what ifs, you know, and, you know, platforms that you can build stuff on so this is an example of an enterprise industrial solution that will be at market in the next several in the next few months um, that is truly delivering the promise of the internet of things so um let's see if i can get back to my slide presentation <coughs> didn't seem to want to all right well i think i was pretty much at the end of my slide uh, slide deck so um I actually think I ended up coming here, finishing up pretty quickly. Um, so why don't I open it up to questions? Um, so anybody has any questions? How oh. are you monetizing that piece that you just demo to us? Uh, what, what, what is your business model? Selling these devices? So, so we've actually are in a partnership with a large company, um, which I'm not actually at liberty right now to disclose. And so uh, our, our, our business model is actually through channel partners. So we usually find the 800 pound gorilla that exists in space. And then we, we come in there and we help them disrupt their own space by, by helping them take 
you know, systems that they thought was the best it was ever going to be, and showing them that the Internet of Things has changed everything. And the thing is, is that you know, most people are still trying to figure out how to use their mobile phone in the enterprise. You know, there's this whole distracting conversation of BYOD and like, oh my God, right? And nobody's even kind of like figured out like, holy crap, I can actually know exactly where my generators are. I can know exactly how to optimize my field service, right? You know, and this is a $50 billion industry. So, you know, the Internet of Things as a practical application in just this one industry is massive, right? And, you know, you don't even touch upon like home healthcare, right? Or, you know, uh, you know, having, for example, uh, very expensive uh, machines or uh, say like MRIs that now have agents that are represented by, by them in the cloud that can now self do some self-diagnosis and figure out how to get people to come fix them, right? So it's really opened up the doors and it's really kind of an amazing time. So, so let's see. So yeah, so that's, uh, yeah. So any more questions, please? about um, iOS 8 and this randomization that they did with Bluetooth. So all these companies, these Bluetooth tracking companies, Enrix, uh, Waze, all these people that track where you're going to get data, that's all. Those so, 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 so specifically was that they actually ra um, randomized your, your MAC address, which is for your wireless Wi-Fi. Um, so, so Waze actually is a self-reporting model. So what happens is the, when you use Waze, yeah, exactly. You're using the app, right? And so because you're using the app, it's self-reporting its location. So and the models that where you don't opt in are they don't know that you're tracking those models go away because that's what Exactly. You're exactly. And so, you know, there's some definitely some benefits about it, but there's also some, you know, sometimes it's nice if they could have like, you know, knowing in aggregate, you know, that there's a lot of foot traffic or congestion over here and not over here, you know, does benefit society. You know, knowing that it's Brian who's <laughs> the culprit because of the congestion, that's not such beneficial. So, um, yes, sorry, sorry. Thank you for the presentation. I have seen this throughout the conference. Um, people talk IoT and mostly as a consumer-centric application. Right? Uh, for example, you made a statement that um, the relationship is ad hoc, etc., which is often the case with consumers and smartphone-centric things. But if you go into processes, if you go into things where there's a structured relationship between sensors towards a common purpose, there is a lot more applicability in, in such a process. And IoT hasn't even touched many of those. So I just want to tell that not everything is at hoc. Then the question I had is, in your traffic light situation, a lot of the cities have older deployments, older controllers, right? older connectivity methods. How are you handling that? Uh, because you can't assume everything is IP yet. So, so actually they are. So it's either a, a dial-up modem or uh, you know, they connect directly into the fi a fiber. So, so the majority of the traffic like controllers are network attached. And sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's low bandwidth, but they are network attached, and there actually are uh, d defined protocols. Um, and uh, NCTC, yeah, NCTC IP, I, I believe, is one of the protocols. So there, are, so it's actually a well-defined, well-structured, and it is pretty very. It's network attached, and in the cases where, like for example, there's uh, Montgomery County, they have uh, 16 of their uh, intersection controllers that actually use cellular, because they're out in the country. So. So they have a cellular backhaul that they are able to connect. So, so, yes? I was wondering if you'd talk a little bit more about the relationship between the sensors and what you're tracking. So you talked about the ELP and the NFC and the barcodes and, and that they track where things are or what they're doing. Can you just speak more in depth about what kind of tracking you have? Sure. So, so in that case, it's basically for asset management. And so what happens is it allows you to have a chain of custody. So at any given time, you know where, where and when the custody of something transferred, like whether it's, so if an asset comes into the warehouse, the warehouse is an agent, it then takes custody of, of the asset, 
right? When the field service person comes to the warehouse to pick up that, you know, uh, um, a power supply that's needed. So what I didn't talk about is integration into existing identity management systems. So what's kind of awesome here is uh, with identity management, um, and we're actually working with Fordrock on this, is uh, there's this notion of is this person allowed to take custody, right? So let's say, for example, there's a field service coming in and um, or it's a, um, and he needs to have some sort of a certification for, you know, for this kind of electronics, right? So he can't just come and pick up the asset. So as he tries to take custody of the asset using the d device, right, just by standing next to it, the system will say, sorry, you're not allowed to have custody because you do not have the right credentials or certification. It could be the same thing for a driver that's trying to haul biohazardous material, right? Maybe they don't have the right uh, credentials, right? So the chain of custody is a really important concept of basically being able to authenticate. So once you authenticate, and remember I talked about trust nothing, but you build trust through layers of authentication, right? So as you get closer and closer to a trusted model, I've been authenticated several times through a variety of mechanisms. Now I'm authenticated and then I can actually be uh, the how how custody is managed between the assets. So the asset comes into the warehouse, warehouse is given to the field tech because they have the right credentials, right? And we talk to uh, Forge Rock's identity management system. We're able to say, can they take cu custody? We say yes, right? And then next, what happens is that they then take it, give it to the truck. Well, the truck can also have a sensor, right? So now the truck is a non-human actor they take custody of the asset, right? This has never been done before, right? So now I have a truck that actually is responsible for an asset, right? So the driver could then leave the truck and the asset is still tethered to the truck. If somebody steals the asset from the truck, the electronic tether is broken and voila, you, all, you know about it. So, so it's the ability to do a chain of custody to do cradle to grave asset management. And what's really interesting is, is that for our, our company, we're finding that the disruptions occurring in uh, fleet management, there's kind of a collapse of fleet management, field service management, and asset management, and they've collapsed into just one space. And that's exactly where GoFactory sits. So, so any more questions? Yes. Uh, you talked a lot about uh, trust or and you need to not trust anything, this ownership, uh, validation, and stuff. Uh, some people in the internet are things talk about well, the problem is, is that <laughs> how do you get uh, any kind of crypt a crypt a cryptological function on a seven-dollar microprocessor? Right. I mean, you can't do it. So, so trying to encrypt, for it's, it's a build encryption into every endpoint, like. You know, if I added an SSL, a chip that does, you know, real-time encryp encryption on this, I bump the cost up by about ten dollars, right? So no, it's no longer, it's no longer, it's no longer a feasible product, right? So, so the reality is that people are going to be building stuff, you know, that that are going to be cheap, that are going to be ins insecure. So you just need to build a system that doesn't, that's designed around a trust nothing model. So, oh, yes. Well, so, so like an operational center is still involved. So for large cities like San Francisco, um, everything still goes through the operations, but it's more designed of real-time response. So most of the case, you'd rather just be made aware of, of how things are moving around the system so that you can in it, step in when, when you need to. There's a lot of cities that don't have operation systems. But in, in, in to, to, to talk to your question exactly, so what the truck has is just custody of the, of the, of the asset is all. It's like if I have a truck with parts on it and those parts are going to be, that inventory is going to be there for several days, 
I want to make sure that that inventory doesn't walk away, right? But when the guy gets to the intersection controller and then he takes that part out of the truck and he puts it into the intersection controller, we want to have a record of every step along the way, but it has to be frictionless, right? So you can't have some field tech guy having to like, you know, go through some paperwork or check boxing, you know, put checking boxes or anything like that. And then that's why radio beacons are awesome because you just need to stand next to it and you can take custody of it. So, so, so any more questions? Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it.